Ladies and gentlemen, people of the internet, welcome back to yet another episode of Crypto Over Coffee. I hope you are doing well today on this fine Friday, but if you're new here, every week I break down the latest news and the hottest topics in the world of technology and cryptocurrency whilst drinking a cup of delicious coffee. Now, in today's episode, we're going to be talking about Bitcoin, Tezos, a huge chain link feature that I'm looking forward to, and of course, our usual 404 Logic Not Found segment. But as we do every single week, let's kick it off with questions from the community on YouTube and Twitter. So I'll pull those up here now on the computer. And if you want to have one of your questions answered, make sure you tweet me at Hishoshi4 or just leave a comment down below. If you would be so inclined as well, please do subscribe to the channel and hit the little bell notification button below so you can get a heads up whenever I post new stuff here on the channel. So let's dive into these questions. The first question is from Ben Jonas one Great work, really appreciated. Thank you. Do you think Kusama has long-term potential? And if so, whom would they be competing with? Uh, so for those who are not aware, Kusama is actually the canary or sort of the bleeding edge version of Polkadot. The Kusama network is actually sort of like the release candidate version of Polkadot before it's really come into uh, its own release in mainnet. And Kusama has actually gotten quite a lot of attention and the token as well has gotten quite a bit of attention as well. So what I think is going to happen is I think Kusama is going to remain the sort of canary battleground testing version of Polkadot, but it will be a place where new features that might not be making their way into Polkadot can be experimented with. I think it's going to be carried forward and you're going to start to see it fork away from what Polkadot is doing in its own stable mainnet release because Kusama is sort of made to be that sort of badass cousin of Polkadot. Uh, and so in terms of competing, I think they would be competing with, of course, things like Cosmos, Polkadot, of course, but maybe not directly. I think people that are using it will be using it knowing that it's going to have different features and a different purpose to sort of be this uh, experimentation ground for developers and such. I also think you might see it being sort of a, a cheaper and less intensive uh, from a cost perspective and from an effort perspective place where developers that want to work with Polkadot can implement things on Kusama first, uh, almost like you see in Ethereum with the true Ethereum test nets. Uh, I don't want to say it's going to be relegated to being a test net, but I think it will be operated like one in the future. So I do think it does have long term potential and it is here to stay. Thank you for your question. Second question is from DC Funhouse. How do you determine which project platform has attracted the most developers? That's a good question. I think there is no true accurate way to measure this, but there are a couple of things you can do to check this out. First and foremost, without ever looking to find actual developers, you can see how many developers might actually want to develop on a project by going to look at documentation. If you go to a website and there's no way for a developer to go onto a project website and find their way to the documentation, that's a bad thing. Developers are not going to go and dig forever to find what they're looking for to get started. That's the first thing. Then you go into the documentation. How recently was it updated? How many tutorials are there showing how to use each feature? How is the documentation? Even if it's as a non-technical person, can you go in there and look at it and be like, this, is, this looks organized, right? So you can see, will this attract developers in the first place? If the answer is no, there probably aren't very many developers working on it outside of the core team. The second thing you can do is go on to GitHub and you can look at the developer community. The place that I would go is to look in the issues section of a GitHub repository because there will often be different people in there that are tinkering with this you know, software or with this application, whatever it is, that are asking questions. Those are usually developers that are working with it and doing things. And then you can also look at the partnership pages and also linked uh, GitHub pages by using the, um, the fork section. So if there are projects that are forking a certain project or protocol, et cetera, you can see how many developers are working on it there. Uh, so there's not exactly a perfect way to find out how many developers are in the community, but you can get a good idea by looking through a lot of these public community pages. And the final thing that I would mention and the best possible way to find at least a general number of interested developer types would be looking for Discord channels or Telegram channels for technical folks. Those always exist for projects that are trying to cultivate a dev community. So thank you very much, DC Funhouse, for your question. Now, let's see. We've got another question here from Sandra Smith. What's your favorite hardware wallet? My favorite hardware wallets 
plural are BC Vault, Ledger Nano X, Cold Card Mark III. Those are the, the best wallets in my opinion. I do also use the Kobo Vault. Uh, we'll talk about Kobo a little bit later. And the Elipal Titan as well, the new, new wallet there. Both are pretty solid um, wallets options as well. Thank you for your question, Sandra. Pratik Parashar. Hey, Shoshi, what are your views on TRB right now? Would love to know your insights. So that's Teller. I'm a big fan of Teller. I made a video, or at least it, Teller was part of a video that I made, I think, a couple months back about some of my favorite altcoins. Teller is another Oracle project sort of competing in the same ring as Chainlink and Band Protocol. And they sort of have this hybrid proof of work, proof of stake sort of vibe going on. And I think that their approach to specifically price feed data, their focal point being DeFi price feeds, puts them in a really good position to get some adoption going forward. And of course, they have some solid exchange listings. They are a quiet, hardworking team that doesn't over market themselves. And I think that they're a really solid project from a tech perspective, even just a tech perspective alone. I really, really like uh, Teller. Um, so hopefully that gives you at least a little bit of an idea of where my thoughts are. Uh, of course, let me know in the comments below if you want a full video on Teller. And I think this is the last question for the day from Mr. Vito. Just started watching your channel. Love the setting you've made. Very well spoken. Not going to hype myself up anymore. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for watching the stuff. Uh, do I have any trusted exchanges to use outside of Binance US and Coinbase? Which I guess means that you are in the US. So yes, I do. I actually don't use Binance US. I don't even have an account. Uh, I don't use Coinbase either, except in very isolated circumstances. My favorite places that are in the US to use for crypto would be Kraken, probably. I know that there are people that don't like Kraken. I actually was one of them, but I think Kraken is a trusted exchange for me, not because they have the best fee structure, not because of any of that, but because they have the best security options, in my humble opinion. Um, out there in terms of being able to use YubiKeys, being able to set up 2FA to the highest level of security. And they encourage you to, with a security measurement on your account, to use all those features. That I respect immensely. And I feel good when there are instances where I have to leave crypto on Kraken or on exchange, which I hate doing. I at least feel good that from the perspective of someone getting into my account, very, very little chance that that happens where other networks or other, sorry, other exchanges, I don't necessarily feel that comfortable. So Kraken is my favorite, but there are other ones that are available in the US. I think KuCoin is available in the US. Uh, OKEx, OKX are available in the US. Uh, and Binance US, nothing really against it, but I just don't really use that many Binance products. So hopefully that helps you, Mr. Vito. Thank you so much for watching my channel and uh, welcome aboard. So folks, those are the questions for the day. Let's dive into the news section. Now, like I said last week, in partnership with the folks over at Kobo who make that awesome Kobo Vault wallet I mentioned before in the q and I'll be giving away a Kobo Tablet Steel Seed Phrase backup device in every single episode from here on out. And all you have to do to enter the random draw is comment on the video down below. I'll be picking a winner every single week and uh, hopefully you can win one of these. And just for transparency though, the product is only available in the US, Canada, and EU. So if you do win and you're from another region, I'll send you BTC instead. So the winner of last week's giveaway is actually right here on the screen. I'll show you the random draw and uh, congratulations to the winner. So now that that's out of the way, let's dive into the news. Kicking things off today with a little bit of Bitcoin analysis. Overall, this week hasn't been all bad. And it really hasn't been all good either. We've had some swings up and down and it seems heavy, heavy resistance at various levels within the 10 to 11K range. I still believe that we will get a bounce before year's end, but I wouldn't hold your breath for the crazy promises that you're seeing online for new all-time highs by December. If I had to guess, and I urge you to remember that my guesses are about as accurate as a dart toss with my eyes closed, that we won't see even a hint of a move towards all-time highs from 2017 until mid next year. Maybe even later than that, it's really hard to say. There's just so much uncertainty as to what will happen both politically and economically around the world. And despite the narrative that Bitcoin thrives in times of economic uncertainty, the fact is there's really no guarantee that it plays out the way that people always say on Twitter or on YouTube promising that 
financial turmoil around the world is good for Bitcoin. The silver lining here, though, is that despite heavy, heavy pressures downwards with CME options, expiries, miner sell off, whale sell off and a whole bunch more, Bitcoin has stayed pretty strong overall. And there were times not so long ago that the cumulative fear associated with these various metrics and moves would have drawn Bitcoin down potentially thousands of dollars. So I take this as an indicator of strong support, stronger than we've seen in the past. And I believe that this also indicates that there's belief that long-term investment is a positive thing within the community as it relates to Bitcoin. So we shall see what the future holds. Now, fans of Tezos will be pretty excited to hear that China's ambitious blockchain services network, or BSN, will be integrating Tezos in its first batch of blockchains that will be a part of the integrated blockchain hub for developers to use and build applications. Ultimately, this will allow people to spin up connections to the public Tezos network and even theoretically create private networks therein. Now, the BSN project is a government-backed effort that's striving to integrate over 40 public blockchains by mid-2021 in an effort to enable businesses and developers of new products and services to utilize public networks to their fullest potential. This is, of course, in accordance with the renewed focus from China's governing bodies to catalyze the adoption of Bitcoin within the country and become a leader globally in the space related to blockchain. Of course, it's worth noting that there seems to be a hidden agenda within this BSN project, and that's really not all that surprising. To me, that's the fact that when you have a central hub where everyone can access public blockchains through it and access the data on those public blockchains, it becomes much easier to control how these networks are used and to, of course, surveil the ingress and egress of information therein. We all are aware of China's stance on surveillance and oversight of their people and people abroad, so this is clearly an undertone within the BSN effort, in my humble opinion. Regardless, for projects that are being selected to be integrated into the BSN from the huge list of options there are out there, projects like Tezos, Solana, Ethereum, EOS, they're all poised to be integrated, it's a positive sign for them that their networks are deemed to be valuable enough to be part of the great BSN project uh, over in China. So definitely interesting times and I'll be watching that one closely. Now, Chainlink has had a pretty rough month, down nearly 60% off of its highs from the last insane bull cycle for the last month, basically, or the last two months for the Link token. But things seem to be looking up again for the Link token now. There are many speculators out there that are trying to figure out why the price has taken such a hit, what's going on, but it's likely a combination of multiple factors. Firstly, a healthy pullback after what was seemingly this too good to be true bull cycle seems like a reasonable explanation as to why the prices are down. And secondly, it's pretty much a reasonable assumption that retail investors and developers on the project kind of drove price down as they were selling off at those high prices. I also think that the excitement around the SmartCon event for Chainlink sort of subsided after the event and there was sort of this cooling off period and there was less hype spinning around the project afterwards that were no longer bringing in new buyers. Of course, this takes nothing away from the project itself and the team from my own interactions with them seem to be completely unfazed by price movement and the actual token itself. The focus really seems to be within that team all on making Chainlink a great product, which I can respect. So from the perspective of high impact features coming through the pipeline that I think could really catalyze the project going forward, I'm most excited about the integration of threshold signatures, which will allow data from multiple off-chain data providers to be aggregated off-chain with a valid signature from each provider encompassed in an aggregate signature. In English, this means in essence that instead of each data provider having to report individually to the blockchain and fees be levied on each of those transactions individually, one transaction could serve large multi-provider data requests or an attestation to a claim on a piece of data with one single valid signature that represents everyone involved. This is a highly simplified version, of course, highly simplified in terms of my definition of it. But the concept is that threshold signatures and the technology that underpin the scheme could theoretically allow Chainlink to scale independently of any blockchain network that they're on and reduce costs on chain whilst doing so. This is, of course, imperative given the current costs associated with operations on the Ethereum blockchain today and it is the critical next step for Chainlink besides the hotly anticipated staking features. So when threshold signatures come, the game really begins. So 
I'm really looking forward to that. Now, it seems like every week I have a new malware or cyber threat to report on, but hey, that's kind of just the way the world works these days. It's always a losing battle. For those of you on Android phones, please listen up as there is a new-ish malware that is tailor-made to steal your crypto and your money. This new breed of malware called Alien is actually a renewed or refreshed version of a remote access Trojan called Cerberus that has caused major, major issues for Android users in the years past. Now, this Alien malware watches your onboard notifications for apps like Coinbase, Blockchain.com Wallet, banking apps, etc., and it utilizes remote access to bypass security measures and steal assets from your apps natively from your phone. These types of attacks are notoriously difficult to detect and also to remove once you're infected, so it's imperative that you exercise caution in terms of what you're doing while you're browsing on the web, downloading files, and installing apps, even from Google Play. And I would personally recommend, if at all possible, to establish an offline device like an old phone or something to you do your 2fa your banking and your crypto use cases to ensure that you're safe so finding another device that you're not downloading things on i think would be very helpful so stay safe out there guys now like last week the sponsor of today's episode is prime xbt and for those in europe and asia and regions that prime xbt supports it is a great option for a wide variety of market trading including cryptocurrency now, one of the things that drew me to Prime XBT when I was researching it was the focus on security and how prominent it was on their website, which, as you know, is something I'm quite passionate about. First and foremost, the crypto assets that are stored custodially are secured with multi-sig cold storage, which is similar to what the security champion Gemini Exchange uses to protect its own assets. Furthermore, the actual hardware security modules that are part of the exchange's core architecture all meet the FIPS 140-2 level three or above certification, which indicates strong physical security and tamper-proofing mechanisms on the actual modules themselves. Furthermore, best practices like app-based 2FA compatibility for Google Authenticator or even better, YubiKey Authenticator are in there as well as standard Bitcoin whitelisting features already set up for anyone that wants to withdraw. This means that not only is your account protected from unauthorized access, but any withdrawn Bitcoin must be to a whitelisted address. You can control the egress of Bitcoin from your account. This helps prevent accidental or otherwise malicious withdrawal of Bitcoin from the platform. Again, if you wanna utilize a variety of different trading services across a wide variety of markets, check out Prime XBT and always utilize and understand good risk management and don't use leverage or margin unless you are aware of the risks associated. Thanks very much for your attention there. Now, it is time for 404 Logic Not Found, and for those who are as of yet uninitiated in this little firecracker of a segment, I highlight notable tech-related fails or otherwise stupid moves that really just need to get some attention. And speaking of attention, if you want to help this video get some attention from the YouTube algorithm gods, please do hit that like button and get subscribed to the channel because it tells the YouTube robots that you're liking what you're seeing. So thank you so much in advance for that. And please do let me know in the comments below if you're really liking the 404 Logic Not Found segment. Now this week there has been significant controversy over yet another meme coin called Few, where some well-known names in the space, influencer types were caught in a Telegram group talking about what appeared to be a pump and dump scheme. Of course, Many of the members implied later that they were joking around in the chat, and there was no intent whatsoever to do anything malicious. However, to me, it's impossible to verify, I guess, the intent of what someone is saying inside of a Telegram chat. You know how hard it is to tell what someone means when they're texting. Now, the Few project was essentially a copy of the Meme project that grew a massive Telegram following and then presented huge profits for those who received early airdrops of the token. Naturally, the Telegram group for few quickly gained traction as well with people trying to get in on the ground floor to profit, but those profits really never materialized, and a fake Uniswap listing that I'm sure scammed quite a few people just added insult to injury for this failed project. Now, the concerning element here more than anything is that 
Joking or not, people who are supposed to set a good example and to guide people towards safe habits and away from scams were at the core of this whole mess. Pump and dumps are not a joke, and it's plain disrespectful to the community to even consider participating in one or making light of the reality that people lose real money with these back alley deals where early investors, influencers, and devs get huge allocations and then dump on newcomers. If you'd like to read more about this and see some screenshots of the Telegram so you can make your own decisions, I'll link an article down below for you to start your digging. But 404 logic not found, this type of thing cannot be allowed to happen. Now, the winners and losers of the week are as follows in this new segment. Again, let me know if you think this is interesting or not. The undisputed winner of the week is anyone who locked in profits from some of the hot coins before the drop, like UNI, the Uniswap token, and were able to buy the subsequent huge dip. Well done. The loser of the week is Mr. David Portnoy, who took to Pompliano's podcast to declare Bitcoin a Ponzi scheme only weeks after saying his heart is crypto and after reportedly buying over a million bucks worth of BTC. So, nice. I also did want to mention that I read an article that discussed some interesting political moves in Israel to reclassify Bitcoin and maybe subsequently other cryptocurrencies as well as money instead of as property, which would reduce the tax levied on Bitcoin transactions and holdings significantly for certain people. And what's more interesting, however, is that in the same conversation, blockchain-based digital currencies were tossed around as a potential replacement for physical currency in the wake of the public health crisis and lockdowns going on around the world, including in Israel. Now, I've personally seen this huge shift in the way that regulators are speaking about cryptocurrencies, sometimes bad, sometimes good, but especially since this whole virus thing broke out. And it seems that things are brewing behind the scenes in a lot of countries about reclassifying digital currencies for tax purposes. So it's gonna be very interesting to see where this starts to go. And I'm gonna be watching the news fairly closely in a lot of these different countries. Now, for those who are interested in VPN protocols, I did have the chance to participate in the beta for the Tachyon protocol, which is a decentralized VPN network project that allows you to offer bandwidth to network participants for rewards on this blockchain-backed network. Now, I went through the process of setting up a node on DigitalOcean, a really nice little cloud instance provider, and I was able to set up staking and start operating the node and use their user interface really, really easily. It took me all about 15, 20 minutes to do, and I was able to generate returns of 25 to 30%, which is the minimum amount of stake in the native token for Tachyon Protocol. So this was pretty darn cool to see and experience in real time to see this all working, and I'll post a future video segment about how to set it up for yourself once the tools go live for everyone to use around the world, and uh, you can let me know what you think in the comments down below. So if you guys have time to stick around, please do check out my most recent altcoin picks video. I picked a few projects that I think really have some potential. So I'll link that up here on the screen for you to click. But if you got to head out, no worries. Thanks so much for watching. And I wish you and your family an amazing and restful weekend and week ahead. Thanks so much. And until next time, cheers.